the rest of the story. 1883. That was Josh Tatum's lucky year. The year of the Liberty Head Nickel. When Josh first saw the newly issued coin, he couldn't believe it. Except for its color, it might easily have been mistaken for $5. It was approximately the same size. The word cents, C-E-N-T-S, was nowhere on the nickel. On the reverse side, there was only a large Roman numeral five. Both coin faces were remarkably similar, each bearing a woman's head wearing a liberty headpiece. So, the color principle distinguishing factor between five cents worth of metal and five dollars worth. Well, that challenge was too enticing to pass up. Josh took the new nickel to a jeweler friend in Boston. The jeweler just happened to have a gold plating machine. They gold plated one of the new nickels, and the result was astonishing. Even its weight was now more impressively similar to that of a $5 gold piece. Josh requested a thousand gold plated nickels from his jeweler friend, and when he received them, he hit the streets. The first victim was a tobacconist from whom Josh purchased a five cent cigar. Josh simply presented a plated nickel, and the man behind the counter promptly gave him $4.95 in change. Wow, the scheme had worked. With a little effort and even less expense, Josh Tatum had increased the value of the common nickel a hundred times. Triumphantly, he took the remaining gilded nickels on a tour of the town. A week later, he'd netted $950. That was quite a sum a century ago. And while Josh had been making change, his jeweler friend had been busy plating more nickels, 5,000 more. So Josh took those, made another even more lucrative excursion. This one through the towns between Boston and New York. Occasionally, a sharp-eyed shopkeeper would grow suspicious, and yet the current date on the coin suggested that the United States Mint had issued a slightly variant design. Josh was not caught until one day. After the story hit the papers, hundreds of Josh's victims stepped forward to accuse him. Although at the trial, as each witness was cross-examined, none who claimed to have been cheated, not one said that Josh had ever actually asked for change. He had merely produced the gilded nickels. He had received change without requesting it. And therefore, it was ruled that the victims had actually swindled themselves. Oh, yes. You see, Josh could not have asked for change. He could not. Josh was a deaf mute. And since there was no law against plating nickels, Josh went free. All your life, you've heard the slang phrase, oh, you're joshing. People will say... When they think you've been making uh, fun of them, trying to fool them, oh, you're joshing. Well, that was originally inspired by the clever deception of Josh Tatum. At least that's what legend says. I don't know for sure about that. I know for sure about this. Everyone who knows that it's against the law to deface American coins now knows the case which inspired that law. That is the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. You know, Josh's scheme was not one to last. By February of 1883, shortly after the coins first went into circulation, people caught on to the scheme. One article in February of 1883 reported, the new nickel just issued by the government is likely to prove a dangerous coin. It has already been caught doing duty as a $5 gold piece. The disguise was dangerously perfect and was so easily assumed. Newspapers wanting to warn shopkeepers to watch out for the counterfeit coins inadvertently explained how to produce the counterfeit coins. An article published in newspapers all across America explained the plebeian coin had simply been treated to an electrotype bath and taken on a coat of bright copper. It had all the luster of royal metal, and nine out of ten men, if their attention had not been directed to it, would have accepted it for gold. Almost as if wanting to entice others to counterfeit the coin, the article continued. It happens that the five dollar gold piece and the nickel are precisely of a size. It also happens that the faces on the two coins are so nearly alike that only one who is accustomed to handling the two 
would be apt to detect the difference. The head of liberty on the nickel is larger than the one on the gold piece, but the same young lady with the Grecian profile seemed to have sat as the model for both. One distinguishing feature between the five cent coin and the five dollar coin is that the five dollar gold piece had a milled edge while the nickel was smooth. Why were these two coins so alike? In 1881, Mint Superintendent Archibald Snowden had Mint Chief Engraver Charles Barber produce new designs for three new coins including the five cent piece. Archibald gave Charles strict instructions. Number one, the head side of the coin would have the head of liberty with the legend liberty and the date. The tail side of the coin would have a wreath of wheat, cotton, and corn around the Roman numeral V designating the denomination of the coin. The United States of America and E Pluribus Unum would eventually encircle the wreath. The design was approved by Treasury Secretary Charles J. Folger and minting the new coins began on January 30th, 1883. Two days later, February the 1st, the coins were released into circulation. It took less than three weeks for the whole country to know just how easy the coins were to alter. Because of the omission of the word since from the back of the coin, its interesting history and its removal from circulation to prevent future fraudsters from taking advantage of the oversight, the 1883 Liberty Head Nickel is a rare coin. If you have an extra $2,250 to spend on a single nickel, you can buy this one on eBay. Now what about Josh Tatum? Was there a real deaf mute named Josh Tatum who counterfeited coins? Or was this just a work of fiction? I could find no newspaper articles linking a Josh Tatum to Nichols. In November 1887, a Josh Tatum was convicted in Tennessee of some unnamed crime and sentenced to 30 days in jail and to pay a $100 fine. This was four years after the counterfeiting. I don't think they were linked. But others were certainly altering the coins. For example, in March of 1883, Mac McCord was arrested in Morgan City, Louisiana for passing gilded nickels. When police searched Mac, they found several gilded nickels on his person. In the same month, John Williamson and Arthur Seegers were charged with the same crime in St. Louis, Missouri. But again, what about Josh Tatum? The earliest known story of Josh Tatum and the counterfeit coins appeared in the Southwest Times of Pulaski, Virginia in December of 1958 in an article entitled, Miss Long Tells Story for Group. Miss Willie Long told the story of Josh Tatum with all the details that we are now familiar with at a meeting of the Southwest Numismatic Society numismatic being the study or collection of currency, coins, tokens, and other like items. Accounts similar to Miss Long's story have been published as the truth ever since. And now I wonder, was Miss Long joshing us? I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And as Paul Harvey would say, good day.